Certainly very much a region on edge here right now. And really, we were out and about in the streets here of Tehran once again today, Becky, and we did hear a lot of people who said they're not necessarily as concerned about that possible Israeli strike, but really about the whole situation escalating and in the end possibly pitting Iran and the U.S. directly against one another, Becky. Yeah, and it's been interesting, hasn't it? Because uh, from the perspective uh, where I am here in the Gulf, for years Iran has uh, posed a significant threat when you talk to sources and leadership around this region. But for the past couple of years, there has been a rapprochement, very specifically from um, Saudi mm -hmm. Arabia, mediated, of course, by the Chinese, and, 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 and you know, better... I won't say good, but better relations uh, between, for example, the UAE and um, Iran. The calculus now, of course, as we see these very visible images of the Iranian foreign minister in Riyadh, for example, and then in Doha, the calculus here is, you know, what does uh, this part of the world do with regard to Tehran? Do you keep it closer <laughs> in order to protect yourselves? Or will we see a further distancing again? And I think certainly from the perspective where we are here, you are seeing uh, this region stay um, close to ensure uh, that they don't, you know, that there are no missteps. W what's the sense where you are? Well, first of all, I think you're absolutely right about the fact that there has been a rapprochement over the past couple of years. And I think that that is really something that set in after the Trump administration left office, because, of course, the Trump administration had very close relations with Saudi Arabia. At that time, you'll recall, there were also really big tensions between Saudi Arabia and Qatar as well, with the Iranians uh, siding with Qatar and really the, the, the Saudis there. Uh, with, uh, with, with the United States really pushing for a more dominant role uh, in the Middle East. And certainly we have seen in the past couple of years a big rapprochement between Saudi Arabia especially and, and Iran sort of starting to, 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 to set uh, or to take place. One of the things that really set that in motion was uh, the administration uh, of Ibrahim Raisi, less so Raisi himself, but more so his foreign minister, Hossein Amir Abdullahian, who really started those talks with the Saudis and tried to get that relation jump-started. A little bit also with the, with the UAE as well, really trying to drum up support for Iran and for better relations between Iran and some of its neighbors uh, in, in the greater Middle Eastern region. I think right now, you're absolutely right. It is a pretty difficult situation for a lot of these countries. They have very good relations with the United States. And if you look at the Gulf countries, of course, a lot of them are now in the Abraham Accords with Israel as well. And they certainly don't appear to want to jeopardize that either. At the same time, the Iranians right now, of course, in that really difficult standoff situation with the Israelis, with the United States, at the same time trying to drum up that support as well. I think for a lot of these Gulf nations, for a lot of the nations in the region who are really essentially trying to stay out of getting involved in that conflict, it's very difficult for them. But it does appear as though right now, at least between Saudi and the Iranians, there is at least a little bit of daylight and some better relations on the horizon, Becky. Mm. Yeah, these are national security issues for these independent countries. They are sovereign states uh, and they make their decisions accordingly. Um, but, you know, from from the, uh, the perspective of Riyadh, the perspective of Abu Dhabi, where we are here, you know, this sort of new architecture of a, of a, a new look, forward looking Middle East um, should cascade through the region if uh, if they get it right, um, this economic integration, this de-escalation. But these, this is a really, really tense time, it has to be said. It's good to have you there in Tehran. We've seen the region is very much on edge as it waits for Israel's next move. And that, our next guest says, is part of its strategy. Kirsten Fontenrose is a senior fellow with the Atlantic Council and writes, quote, Israel's response to the missile barrage, that it will respond at a time and place of its choosing, forces Iran to expend the manpower and resources to sustain a heightened defence posture while Israel can uh, continue its campaigns against Hezbollah and Hamas. It's an interesting perspective. Kirsten joins us now. It's good to have you. Um, really good to have you. Uh, let's just talk about uh, where we are with regard Israel and Hezbollah as we wait to see um, what happens with regard Iran very specifically. What's your perspective at this point? I do think I stand by what I wrote about Israel thinking, hey, if we can make 
Iran to sort of keep this defensive posture, we're in a good place because they will focus on their defenses. They'll focus on moving things underground. They'll focus on fortifying their radar systems. And we can focus on the fight with Hezbollah. We can focus on targeting leadership. We can focus on pushing fighters back. We can focus what our next steps are on a single front without having to worry about fighting on many fronts. And they've taken a page out of Iran's own playbook by saying we'll respond at a time and place that they're choosing. It's almost a word for word quote of what Iran has said previously about responding to Israel. So it, it, it lets them kind of be the master of the strategy here instead of you know being run by the tyranny of the battlefield. The Iranian foreign minister, meantime, making the rounds. We've been discussing that with our uh, colleagues both in Tel Aviv and, and very specifically in Tehran today. What do you make of the, um, of the moves around the region by the Iranian foreign minister? The very visible um, pictures of him with, for example, the leader of Saudi Arabia. And what role these Gulf monarchies in this today and going forward. The Iranian foreign minister has a funny way of playing diplomacy. It's kind of like a mafia don. He comes in with a handshake and kind of a cheesy vest or the like. And he says to them, uh, if, if you allow Israel to use your airspace for any sort of attack on Iran, we will retaliate by attacking you. We will take it out on you. He also threatened that if Iran's oil facilities are struck by Israel and Iran is unable to export oil, remember that this exporting is sanctions evasion, then Iran will make sure that Gulf nations are also unable to export oil. So it's these veiled threats with a handshake and a smile that are kind of Iran's way of doing foreign policy. For Saudi Arabia, they are the front line. You're the UAE. You are the front line. You're any of the Gulf states. You are the easiest place for Iran to land a missile, to land a drone quickly without the 13 hours of early warning that Israel gets when something is launched at, at them slow and low. So the Gulf has to be thinking about, all right, how do we play this? How do we make sure that this adversary is put in a box, which we would like to see, but in a way that does not make us less safe. Mm. What I think Iran has not considered is that by making this threat about strikes on their oil facilities, they've actually increased the likelihood of an Israeli attack on their nuclear sites instead of their oil facilities. So I'm not sure if they really gamed that out, but they've certainly they've certainly got the attention of the Gulf states who already think that the Houthi threats to Red Sea shipping are enough of a problem for their oil exports. They don't need Iran lobbing more missiles at them like they did at Abqaiq in 2019. Are you surprised by the sort of openness and very visible sort of warm um, response to um, Iran's diplomatic moves around this region? I'm asking you that almost as a sort of rhetorical question because, you know, I'm sitting here in region, you and I have met here a number of times, I'm sitting here in region, I'm not surprised. And I think it's important for our viewers around the world who may have expected, you know, despite a rapprochement between the Saudis and the Iranians, for things to be a lot less sort of close looking. I'm just wondering what the calculus here is. I mean, you know, Riyadh is a very strong ally of the United States. What message is being sent sort of via Riyadh at this point? One message that is worrying if you're in Washington is simply that the Gulf states have watched Israel effectively brush off U.S. Uh, pleas and policy ideas because we're in a lame duck presidency situation. This is not a flaw of a Biden administration or any administration. It's simply the reality of the political environment in Washington right now leading up to a U.S. election. So they're thinking, well, gosh, if Israel is blowing off the U.S., we can't count on the U.S. to perhaps contain what Israeli action might be. We can't count on the U.S. taking action on our behalf because they're self-obsessed right now. So we've really got to worry about our own interests. And that means hedging. That means if you refuse to accept the foreign minister's visit, you're sending a message. And that message looks aggressive. And that message looks one-sided. So of course they're going to take this meeting. We have really professional intelligence services in both the UAE and Saudi and other parts of the Gulf. So, you know, these visits are also a chance for them to really get a sense of that person sitting in front of them. How serious are they? How significant are these threats? What do they really mean? Um, who else is behind mm. this policy that they're discussing? What are they really saying? So it's a chance for them to also get a better picture of what this adversary intends to do.